verses, please stand if you're able and sing with us. This is my father's world. Children. Yeah, my favorite. <laughs> 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 
uh, June 27th is uh, over 55. June 9th is a business meeting, or July 9th is a business meeting. It isn't though. And it isn't. Yeah, though. yeah, because you have to move it because uh, two of the deacons will be on a boat, I think. A long, slow boat to China. <laughs> uh, July 6th is a pool party at Dick and Nan's. Woo! Yep, Dick, you got the pool ready, Dick? No, but I got the rules. <laughs> oh, you got rules, but. <laughs> three daughters at that pool and I didn't think there was any girls. But, uh, uh, July 25th is over 55. Uh, the ongoing announcements, Bible study, donuts, Sunday school, uh, Pastor Kevin Mariah. Are there any other announcements? Slow down, sir, because Bible study, um, we will not start our next study until July 5th. Yes, the day after 4th of July. Um, we'll start, and we're going to be doing the Bible Project series called Spiritual Beings. So there's a link there if you want to go explore that more. But um, I will be at our denominational biennial um, this week. Um, so basically Wednesday to Wednesday. So we won't have Bible study for two weeks while that happens. And um, so I'll be our delegate for voting on stuff and um, leading a couple of workshops. So um, <laughs> my cheerleaders are very excited about this. So I will be back um, the 28th. I'm making this announcement for Rosemary. She's not here today, so she asked me to announce this. Some of you already know that July 6th is Don Lowry's 90th birthday, and Rosemary has contacted, I think probably most of us, about sending birthday cards. His daughter, Jill, will be um, creating a scrapbook, and she would like to put cards from Liberty Friends. So if you do not have Jill's address, I have it, so please let me know if you need it and try to get those cards in the mail this week. And also, Heather, you can add July 12th to the announcements for Circle, and we'll be meeting at Cross America at noon. Okay, if there are no other announcements at this time, <clears throat> we'll have our happy dollars. So if you're happy and you know it, hand us a dollar and you can tell us why you're happy. The deacons use this, this these monies in the uh, community to help those in their time of need. Is anyone happy? We had our first young adult Bible study on Friday, and I think everyone had a really good time. So, I do not have anybody, <laughs> but um, I'll put it in. <laughs> um, I, I am happy that it's Father's Day, and I have to contemplate this during announcement, so I'm just put it in happy dollar for it. There are um, amazing gifts up there for all of the men in the church, all of the... I have a plan, Christy. Oh, never mind. I don't have to give a dollar anymore. <laughs> you owe us a dollar for taking your time. <laughs> so I have two, I have like five dollars in there, so I'm going to say two. So I'm happy it's Father's Day, basically, and Papa's here. And um, my mom got married yesterday, so I'm happy about that. Um, we're happy because thank you to everyone who came to the baby shower last week. It was great. It's really the company that makes it the best. 
and we're happy about Bible study. It was really fun. And Eric's just happy, but he didn't want to talk in the microphone. <laughs> we can all say that's a first, that he didn't want to talk, so. Spent last week in Canada with five other friends. Nobody fell in the lake and we caught 877 fish. They didn't keep that many. I'm happy because next Sunday I get to give out free mom hugs, which is the first time I've been able to do that. And I'm looking forward to that and showing them Hopefully, a little bit about Christ's love really looks like that it doesn't care what color you are, what you you know where you come from. He just loves you. And the other thing, I am very happy and thankful for Old National Bank because once again, someone has gotten to my checking account and they did catch it before they got on the plane for over five hundred dollars. So. I don't think that's how it works. I want to thank everyone that uh, donated for Tatum for this quick contest, and uh, all the ladies, we went and visited um, Mina Lowry, the firm's daughter at Greytown, and it's a miracle at what she's been through, that, as good as she is, we really, it was one of the most rewarding days I think we've ever spent. I'm going to stand up for this. I don't know if you all noticed on the news and everything, the Southern Baptist had their convention, which is what I was raised as the Southern Baptist. And uh, a lot of the churches have withdrawn from Southern Baptist because they were against women with any titles of pastors, ministers, or anything in the churches and unable to teach and all this kind of stuff. Well, so we are American Baptist. And uh, so our convention is next week. And this is phenomenal that our pastor, Mariah, is yeah. going to be there and be speaking. Yeah. Yeah. Two times at our convention. That is cool. Big, big time, big time stuff. <laughs> I'm happy that me and my youngest daughter got baptized last weekend, and we also had Maya's graduation here, so happy for both of those. Most of you know Caitlin is still on midnights, but so she's not here. But she would say that uh, we're all happy that Bradley won his game, part of the city tournament. Yeah, the David Casey won. So yeah, the first one. So they play at uh, six at Northwestern Park Monday. Yeah, tomorrow night. So but very exciting. Yes, it really was. And he he got what at least two maybe. Hits so that's it, and he's out there being a cheerleader. I mean, <laughs> when they're out in the field, he goes strike out, and they'll let go strike. <laughs> yeah, just different things. So it's a lot of fun to see. Yeah, I remember those days. <laughs> now you have a grandchild that's gonna uh, get to do all those things and he'll get to relive it. <laughs> yeah. At this time, we'll uh, go have a call to worship. Let's join together in prayer. God, we thank you for the gift of today, the reminder that you are our Father, our eternal parent, the perfect example for us to look to. Lord, we pray that as we are in this space together, we feel guided and directed by your paternal hands. 
that you lead us into new places for us to be able to flourish and grow. God, we pray that you bless this space as we are together. We feel your presence here in this space, encouraging us, growing us, and preparing us for what we have in store throughout this week. Lord, we love you and we thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. I'd like to invite our candle lighters up at this time. This time, if the ushers will come forward, I have our offering. of emotions filling our hearts, acknowledging the joy and gratitude swelling within us for the fathers who have shaped our lives with love and guidance. We also recognize the absence and longing some of us may carry, missing the embrace of a father no longer present. And we embrace the bittersweet remembrance of fathers who have passed, cherishing their memories and the imprints they have left on our souls. We offer solace and compassion for those where the relationships 
bear scars, hoping for healing and growth. But today, we bless the tender moments. We bless learning lessons that were shared. We bless unbreakable bonds. We bless, bless growth in relationships as they evolve and change as we grow. We bless this moment in all its beautiful, intricate complexity. And thank you, God, for being the perfect parent and example for all of us. Amen. We thank you for all of you who have um, shaped our lives in one way or another. And so at the end of service, we invite you to come up, get yourself a treat, get yourself a journal, um, and just know that we appreciate you. At this time, we're going to invite the children and children at heart up front for a message from Nam. How are you? Good. <laughs> well, you know what? We've not had a catastrophe at our house. <laughs> we, uh, there were some kids swimming in the pool, and there was a robin. We got a robin's nest. Shells. 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 It's that little? A shell. It, a shell? It's a... Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not. You can talk about me. Yes. Yes. yes you went and found some shells? Yes. Uh-huh. Whales. Rosens. I. You know what? I bet next week you can do this and I won't even have to say anything. No, you know. Okay. But this... Mama Robin was teaching her babies, you know, how to fly. And all of a sudden, Lula got a hold of it. And then I yelled at Lula. She let go of the, of the bird. And then Omer got a hold of it. And uh, Cap, oh, he was so upset about the bird. And I says, well, I think it's, I really thought it was dead. But I said, I think it's just in shock. So I went back in the house about 15 minutes later, I come back out and I says, how's the bird? He said, it died. He said, it's dead. So I said, well, I'll go in and get some plastic sacks and we'll wrap him up and we'll send him to heaven to be with Jesus. So I went in and I got a couple of plastic bags and I leaned down to pick that bird up and that thing took off. It about scared me to death and I said, well, the had of the resurrection. So we <laughs> And have you ever done something you know you're not supposed to do? Oh, no, you haven't. Have you? <laughs> well, Bobby was playing with a vase, and he saw something in there, so he stuck his hand in, and he got a hold of it, and he couldn't get his hand out. So he got, oh, he started yelling, and he said, Dad, Dad, come and help me. So his dad went in to help him, and they tried everything. and. His dad thought he was going to have to break the vase to get his hand out of there. So he said, okay, Bobby, we're going to try one more thing. He said, uh, let go of your fist. Uh, you know, don't have a fist. Let your fingers go down and we'll pull it out. And Bobby looked at him and he says, Daddy, I can't do that. I lose my penny. And all the time he had a hold of a penny and he couldn't get his hand out. And dad says, you know, Bobby, huh? No, but he will. Yeah, it won't come. He'll get his hand out of the place. I mean, not to break it. Is okay, well, so Dad looked at him and he says, You know, Bobby, people are a lot like that. We don't want, but we don't, we want to hang on to what's bad in this world and not let God unfold our hands to follow Him. So remember, don't hang on to pennies in the jar because you won't be able to get your hand out. Yeah, that's 
That's right, but you can't get your hand out. Penny. Right? The only way the only way they can get that penny out is if he lets go of it and get his hand out and then pour the penny out. Oh yeah. Okay. That's <laughs> pretty. Uh, I think you can do this next week, and Iris can take over the week after, okay? <laughs> Dear God, thank you so much for the gift of these children. They are the jewels in our lives. And, and dear God, thank you so much for letting me have the pleasure of setting them here and loving them. In your holy name we pray, amen. Anyway, very tiny little boy. Just got word he went into surgery and the kidney was too large for him, so he's back on the list. So he's been waiting for three years, so please let's just keep him in our prayers. Um, I'm not sure if you guys remember her or not, but um, Sarah Eggy, her last name's E-G-E, um, she used to be my stepdaughter. Um, she's only 26 and she's in the hospital and she's having second degree block with her heart. Um, they're trying to put an emergency pacemaker in um, and nothing is lining up right. Um, so if we can keep her in our prayers, um, they're trying to do what they can and they're going to transfer her to IU in Indianapolis. But she's just not doing very well. So. Her first name? Sarah. Speaking of kidney problems, uh, a lady at the Connection Church, where we were at a senior function, learned Nancy Klingeman is her last name, if you want that. But she let me know she's in stage four kidney cancer, trying dialysis, but she didn't seem very hopeful. And she's probably about you guys' age, yeah. You know, not really. And then. One of my high school girlfriends in Illinois, um, she didn't ask prayer for her, but um, like you, Mariah, she's, except this is a mission trip, rather, um, and her name is Lily Batchelder, um, going on a mission trip, flying to Panama. So they, so safe travels and successful mission for them. And then be with the boys tomorrow night playing, help them do their best. Nobody got hurt, so sometimes, you know, that ball can come and really, yeah, sting and, or hit them in the head. Or, I mean, it's good they wear helmets now. I think when maybe you played or my brothers played, yeah, no helmets. <laughs> Okay. 
okay, I guess we're gonna pray for less old people. <laughs> safe travels for those in the time of need, find their safe passage, <clears throat> touch them with your healing touch, look after the sick and the needy, help the caregivers, our soldiers in harm's way. On this day, we ask that you provide us more of the same. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This time we'll have a Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. for it today comes from Matthew chapter 9 and this will bleed into chapter 10. Jesus traveled among all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues announcing the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and every sickness. Now when Jesus saw the crowds he had compassion for them because they were troubled and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the size of the harvest is bigger than you can imagine, but there are few workers. Therefore, plead with the Lord of the harvest to send out workers for his harvest. He called his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to throw them out and to heal every disease and every sickness. Here are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon, the Cananean, and Judas, who betrayed Jesus. Jesus sent these 12 out and commanded them, don't go among the Gentiles or in a Samaritan city. Go instead to the lost sheep, the people of Israel. As you go, make this announcement. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those with skin diseases, and throw out demons. You've received without having to pay, therefore give without demanding payment. in school? Were you the leader, the worker bee, or maybe the freeloader? Yeah. <laughs> Both. 
just says, yes. The first two responsible, okay. So nobody's admitting to being the freeloader in the room? <laughs> that was a husband and wife combo of her pointing at him and him looking out. That was tough. Yeah. Dad had to attend class to be able to participate in the projects. We won't tell you about the time they blew up an apple machine at school. Like, that's, that's another story. Um, I, so how did you feel about group projects? Did you like them? No. We've got some no's. I know there are teachers in the room. How do teachers feel about group projects? Or retired teachers too? Eh, neutral? Whatever? I, last week I told you about a pass or fail I had with Kit Kats. Um, this is more of a, a student fail, I suppose, but I remember being in eighth grade and um, I was in a social studies class and we were assigned to group up and um, do a group project and we would pick something that wasn't on the like school, the schedule for us to learn about and that we would present that piece of history to the class. Um, and so my friend Abby and I were paired up together and I don't know if I was just clueless or what, but I was off in La La Land when we were picking our topics, and she picked the Japanese internment. I know, very heavy topic, but I somehow got all the way to eighth grade and had never heard about the U.S. Japanese internment camps. I don't know how that had happened. Um, and I just distinctly, I think the reason that the project itself was so vague to me um, now in my memory is because I was so shocked of learning it from her that I wasn't really any help in the actual project. Like, I think I taped some pictures onto a poster and that might have been the extent of my help. So in hindsight, it's like, thanks Abby for helping us get that good grade because uh, yeah, I was not helpful whatsoever. Sometimes I think group projects can be like that where um, one person's just freeloading, and sometimes you'll have like the clash of leaders, you know, two people wanting to be the, the ones in charge and having a tough time figuring out how to balance those power dynamics. Um, and so in our text today, we are gonna be investigating more of Abraham's story um, and how God had commissioned him last week with this blessed to be a blessing role. And God's trying to get him back on the group project plan because he and his wife went rogue. Um, so we're gonna kind of um, examine that together today, getting back on plan with God's plan. So I invite you to turn with me to Genesis 18 and we're gonna look at um, verses one through 15. And um, I'm excited to once again have another installation in this Genesis series, reminding us that this is not a fact-finding mission, but um, a series for us to remember who God made us to be, and that Genesis is a foundational identity story for us as God's people. So let's learn from Abraham in his experience. This is Genesis 18, verses 1 through 15. The Lord appeared to Abraham at the Oaks of Mamre while he sat at the entrance of his tent in the day's heat. He looked up and suddenly saw three men standing near him. As soon as he saw them, he ran from his tent entrance to greet them and bowed deeply. He said, Sirs, if you would be so kind, don't just pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought so you may wash your feet and refresh yourselves under the tree. Let me offer you a little bread so you will feel stronger, and after that you may leave your servant and go on your way, since you have visited your servant. They responded, fine, do just as you have said. So Abraham hurried to Sarah at his tent and said, hurry, knead three seahs of the finest flour and make some baked goods. Abraham ran to the cattle, took a healthy young calf, and gave it to a servant who prepared it quickly. Then Abraham took butter, milk, 
and the calf that had been prepared put the food in front of them and stood under the tree near them as they ate. They said to him, where's your wife, Sarah? And he said, right here in the tent. Then one of the men said, I will definitely, I will definitely return to you about this time next year. Then your wife, Sarah, will have a son. Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were both very old. Sarah was no longer menstruating. So Sarah laughed to herself, thinking, I'm no longer able to have children, and my husband is old. The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Me give birth at my age? Is anything too difficult for the Lord? When I return to you about this time next year, Sarah will have a son. Sarah lied and said, I didn't laugh because she was frightened. But he said, no, you laughed. <coughs> okay, last week we were in Genesis 12. And we had just investigated or experienced um, God's call to Abraham. His name was Abraham at the time, and his wife's name was Sarai. And he calls them to go um, to this new place, away from everything that they know, to this new place and that God would be their God and bless them to be a blessing. Talked about this, that the, the role that they had to play would be filtered through the lens of God's intentions. Well, in Genesis 15, um, we see some time has passed and that still no son has happened that God promised Abraham. But once again, God reiterates this promise. When Abraham was first 75 in Genesis 12, time has passed and still no son. Genesis 16, Abraham and Sarah made a plan on how to fulfill God's promise themselves. We'll get ourselves a son somehow. And their process of getting Ishmael was through the sexual exploitation of Hagar, their servant. Abraham was 86 at this time, so 11 years had passed from God's original promise time. And there was mistreatment of Hagar that they used to justify their means and their plans to get themselves a son. Then we get to Genesis 16. Oh, I just talked about Genesis 16. Um, then we get to Genesis 17. And God makes a covenant with Abraham. He renews his promise again. Abraham and Sarai are 190 years old. Abraham is 100. Sarai is 90. How about I say that that way? Okay. They're, they're old. You now would be lucky to get to that age, right? And God's saying they're going to bear a child. Um, so, and Abraham, in the midst of this conversation, God changes their names. He's Abraham and she's Sarah now. But God's like, what about Ishmael? Isn't he good enough? And God's like, that wasn't the design I had in mind. The way you used Hagar, the way you mistreated her, that, that was you going rogue. We're going we're gonna to do this and fulfill the plan by my design. Not by your hands, but mine. Sarah will have a child, and his name will be Isaac. So we hear this promise, and that the next year it's going to come. And it seems like Genesis 17 and 18 seem to repeat themselves, but... Something in the, the intensity um, increases because in Genesis 18 we saw some men show up, and the language there suggests some kind of celestial beings, not humans, um, visiting. That is a bunny trail for another day and another time. In a couple weeks, we're going to talk about spiritual beings in Bible study. Come hang out with us July 5th, okay? <clears throat> but we see these guests arrive. Abraham and Sarah pour out lap 
lavish hospitality on them, killing an animal, creating bread, and uh, providing butter and milk. And once again, they hear the promise of a son. At this point, 90-year-old Sarah laughs at the prospect. Yeah, okay, sure, I'm going to have a son. I remember 25 years ago when God said I was going to have a son. <laughs> it still hasn't happened yet. We even made a plan and got us a son. And that, you didn't even approve that one. So, mm -hmm, sure, God's going to approve this plan. I believe it. Yeah, definitely. Honestly, I don't blame Sarah. When you think about... Okay, it's, it's Father's Day, but let's just make a joke for a minute, okay? Wives, if you were to say to your husband, hey, can you take care of this thing? And they're like, yeah, I'll definitely do that. And you had to wait 25 years for it to happen? At what point do you just say, it's, it's, oh, I'm going to hire somebody to take care of it? Right? Maybe like two months I would probably, you know. develop trust. I mean, God already had them develop trust to go away from all of their support structure into this new place. But this is another layer to that. And I can't explain to you why sometimes God's promises take a while to be fulfilled. If, I, if it were up to me, if it were my plan, obviously we wouldn't have to wait because, you know, I'm ready for things right now. But it's like God has a better design in mind than we originally intended. And I love that God's last phrase in this section is, is there anything too difficult for the Lord? Reminding us that no matter what things we think are outside of God's reach, it's possible. And... If you continue reading in Genesis, Genesis 21, we see Isaac is born. Uh, we also see some tragedy as the birth of Isaac leads Sarah to say, okay, Hagar and Ishmael need to be kicked out. And she's, she's done with them. But the beauty is that God blesses Hagar and Ishmael and says that Ishmael will be a great nation himself with 12 tribes of descendants. But when you think about the, the journey of Abraham and Sarah and the relationship with God, God promises things over and over again. And Abraham and Sarah try to figure out how to fulfill it themselves. And it's easy when we're reading a narrative to look at them and go, man, those fools, don't they just know to trust God? But how frequently when we are in sticky situations in life, that we don't get God's plan, or we put words in God's mouth and make a mess of things. Someone's loved one dies, and we say something like, oh, God needed an angel. It was in God's plan. Somebody loses a job or gets fired, similar thing. God's got a better plan for you. When God closes a door, he opens a window. Or when someone can't have a child, and you just throw up your arms and go, must not be in God's plans, I guess. <laughs> We're not much better than Abraham and Sarah when it comes to addressing God's plans and making sense of things. We try to write narratives that really make me think, is that the God we're supposed to follow? Do we worship a God that just takes people away because he's needy? Like, oh, man, I'm just feeling lonely today. I better, better make Chris die so that he can come hang out with me. He's looking really good and healthy today. That's why I'm picking on him, okay? That's not me putting a number on Chris's head. 
But we try to explain and make sense of God's plans because we want to be the ones in control. It's this group project and we're having tension about who's the leader of it. And so we look at the scripture reading for today and Jesus is feeling compassion for the people around him. The ministry and the load is so big that he prepares his disciples to go out and be his co-workers in ministry. But if you notice, he gives some very specific instructions to them that seem a little sticky. He's like, okay, you can do this and this, but don't go stick to the Israelites, okay? Don't go to those guys. And also don't take money. But like, these are the things you can do. If you notice, he doesn't give them full license to do everything that Jesus does. He gives them a specific selection of responsibilities to take care of. And depending on the gospel you read, when Jesus sends them out, they struggle to even fulfill those things. Jesus is the one with the plan, and his disciples are his worker bees. His co-workers in that labor. Where God commissioned humans in Genesis 1 and commissioned Abraham in Genesis 12, Christ commissions disciples in Matthew 28, and we as humans are participants in God's plan, but not the ones in charge. God's well experienced with humans trying to take control of the group project. And I think about this, um, Ruth mentioned this um, in the midst of our prayer requests and everything, but when I think about the Southern Baptist Conference um, and the decisions they made, so some churches just automatically left. In other churches, they had a great meeting, they had this big meeting, and they voted churches out. They're like, oh, they ordain women or let them be leadership? Get out. They voted on this. And a bunch of churches decided, yeah, we don't want them around. We would rather have less churches in our denomination because they like women in leadership than to have more people hearing the gospel. Does that sound like God's plan from Genesis 1? Where humans are called to together to serve? Does that sound like blessing to be a blessing? Or to go and make disciples? It sounds like humans going rogue with God's plan. And making sure that power and favoritism and exclusion are part of it. That sounds like Genesis 3, not the creation design. on God. God, the perfect parent, the example on Mother's Day and on Father's Day. The one who knows what's best for us and how to help us flourish. God's plan doesn't include exploitation, favoritism, or exclusion. When we are designing our plans and intentions for ministry. Uh, we've been talking about making a rule of life for ourselves. The instructions are still in the back of your periods. And you're developing your plan. And any of those things show up, showing favoritism or exclusion, say, oh, well, we can design this ministry, but women can't lead. Or we're going to design this ministry, but we're going to check if you're married and who you're married to before you can participate. Or if you've only been married one time or multiple times, or if you have kids or not kids, there's no strings attached to the cross. God's plan 
is for all of creation. And we see that in Genesis, and we see that in Jesus. It's time our plans go back to God's plan. Stop making our rogue designs and join the group project once again so that we can bless others as we have been blessed. Perhaps Father's Day has some sticky connections for you. Or perhaps I really hope it's just simply a day filled with joy. But maybe there's some complexity to it. And I invite you today to be the cycle breaker of those sticky feelings. Be the one that gets back to the design and plan God has in mind for all humans, for love and compassion to be pouring out like Jesus in our scripture reading. For us to fulfill our human commission of Genesis 1 and our disciples commission in Matthew 28. Let's get back to the plan. The perfect one. And see how much love and compassion we can pour out. Gracious God, we thank you for today. We thank you as we join together in this service and have bellies full from breakfast and remember the relationships of father figures in our lives, that we ask you to help us get back to the plan, that we don't take the burdens that are on our shoulders and go rogue with them, but we're able to release the pains we have felt, release our preferences, and remember to filter all of our plans that we make through your heart. Lord, we love you and we thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. As we close our service, um, we are going to sing our closing benediction where we stand and hold hands together. Um, do so as you feel comfortable. But also, Dustin was setting the example of you. Were <laughs> um, Jack's ready to go too. Um, don't forget any of the men in the church. There are cookies and journals up front for you. We don't check your dad carrying status for you to get those things, okay? Um, so I invite you to make sure to get to your gifts and know we are grateful. Join us as we sing our closing benediction. Thank you for coming.